The benchmark is those that spend over 100,000 a year on fundraising according to the numbers that they provide to the Charity Commission. Uh, they are the ones that are eligible. But I'll ask Stephen if you'd be kind enough to give more accurate numbers and more up-to-date numbers than I'm able to give. Yes, of course, the, uh, the numbers change all the time because we're still pursuing the uh, charities who haven't yet paid. Um, the, the figures at the moment are there are over 1,300 charities who have paid uh, and committed, and this is important, to the fundraising promise and the code of fundraising practice. And that includes all but a handful of the larger charities, so that is really good news. We've got about 370 charities uh, who are um, still not committed to paying, and, and they're a mixture of people who've refused and if they refuse, we, we do go back to them, so we're chasing them. And, and as Michael said, charities, and this is the bit that astonishes me, who have just not responded. And uh, uh, that, that does uh, surprise me, given the publicity around all of this, the Edmonton Review, and so on. But there are a number who have still not responded at all, and we've probably had four or five separate communications with every charity on the list. They're not, sorry, when you say small charities, they're not small, are they? No, indeed. Um, as, as Michael said, they're, they're not small. These are all charities who are spending over 100,000 a year on fundraising. So they are, they are um, large-ish charities, but not the largest ones. And, and sorry, just one further point. Those that have given you reasons what for not subscribing, what are those reasons? They say it's voluntary. Yes, uh, all, all sorts of reasons. It's voluntary, so <coughs> you don't have to. Uh, this is not a problem, uh, we don't recognise it as, as a problem, we don't want more regulation. Um, and, and some of them, frankly, um, we don't know who you are and what this is about, so we're not going to pay. So a whole variety of uh, different arguments. Thank you, Steve. Uh, plainly, it was felt appropriate to move quickly to an adjudication. Thank you. Yes. Um, if small charities are telling us that they don't really feel that they're getting that much from the regulator, and not getting what? They're not getting that much benefit from the regulator and that they don't feel that it's good value to pay. What's your communication strategy to persuade small charities that you do actually represent a good deal for them? Well, if they sign up to uh, our code uh, and they, they get our seal of approval, which is a formal uh, seal of approval, it will show donors and over time in, in donors' minds, they will build up a sense that, that giving to a charity that is approved by or recognised and registered with us is a sign of, gives donors confidence that they're dealing with a real charity. So there's a huge benefit uh, to charities in registering, whether they're liable for the levy or they just, if they hit that threshold, uh, or whether they're just registering for a nominal fee, uh, so they get the tick of approval. I think that's a huge benefit for charities in the long term, and it gives confidence to the donors. And we, our, our mission essentially is, is to represent the interests of the donors, which in turn is in the interests of charities. It's just that you've, you've tried that for a year, and it doesn't seem to work. Is there any new approach that you think might work? Uh, I'm confident it will work, and I'm, you know, it, ta it takes quite a while to change people's perceptions and, and to win people over. But I don't want to be negative because so many charities have signed up. Many, have, uh, many introduced uh, certain measures before they were required to. So I, th I think the, the, the groundswell is very much in favour. People recognise there is a problem here, you know, which, for which you know, I think we should all be grateful to the media for once for, for exposing much of the wrongdoing that has led, led us to this, to this place. So I, I wouldn't be negative at all. I think most charities get it. A few don't, uh, there's, there's always a few who take, who take longer to realise the benefit, but we, we think the, the end goal is so important that we won't give up. The whole object is to have a, a successful, independent, self-regulatory body that isn't statutory. But if, if charities continue to refuse uh, and, the, and the statutory regime is jeopardised, which it isn't, but if it were to be jeopardised uh, by people's refusal to pay, then we'd have to go to a statutory regime. A mid-sized working group that's met with Stephen quite a lot over the last year and a half. Um, back in April, we spoke about the importance, 
excuse me, of a, a press strategy around the public launch of the FPS and how we could really use this as a positive opportunity um, and fundraisers are very much in support of this. Um, my first question is, have fundraisers been asked for comments on their support of the FPS and about the changes they have been making in the last two years? Right, just can we take one question at a time? Yeah, because that's the first one. My memory is not <laughs> that wonderful. Um, uh, hang, hang on, let's, let's deal with that point first. The, the, the point is whether we've considered, I think, I, I remember talking to some leader of one major charity who said, oh, for God's sake, just stop consulting and get on with it. Um, I think we have, we have consulted at every level, on every step of every move that we've made. Every document, uh, the FPS uh, was consulted on for well over six months uh, before we, the working group consulted, the working group's recommendations were consulted on, uh, the proposals that we were determined to, to put in place that we thought were the right, they were consulted on. We, we really, yeah, I, no, I don't think we could ever be criticised, we could be criticised for over consulting. Sorry, no, I think my question probably wasn't very clear. It was because um, I've been part of those consultations and how oh, it have been so. Um, but it was more around the, the press strategy and whether there was any comments. Yeah, it's going it's to take, it's gonna take a while. Uh, we, we feel that one of our key, uh, uh, key tasks for the coming year and years as a board, as an organisation, is to create more and more, as much public awareness as we can of what we exist to do. Um, you know, we... we we do, we're, we're very available to the press, to, to the media. Uh, I'm Stephen and I and Philip uh, uh, have, have done endless media over the last 48, uh, 72 hours, uh, getting the message across, you know, on the Today Show, on Radio 2, on local radio, uh, and so on. So this is, we will we'll just keep going at it to, to make sure the public know that there is a resource there which can help them. Uh, and the work, that work will never be done. Thank you. My second small question was around, actually I think I'm one of quite a few fundraisers who was uh, sorely disappointed to see that it seemed to be the same negative rhetoric from the last few years and um, coming out again alongside some factual inaccuracies around the FPS. Um, my second question was, I suppose, what the press strategy is going forward for the fundraising regulator and the FPS and how as fundraisers we might be able to support in that. Well, the, the strategy is to, is to create awareness. What we don't want to do is to throw money. Uh, at a marketing campaign, you know that that would be not a good use of money. Uh, we sadly, you know, high-profile bad cases uh, create uh, awareness. Uh, but in the meantime, we will continue to engage with the media at every possible opportunity to get our message across or, or what we have available. Stephen's dying to come in, which is unlike him. <laughs> I am particularly self-effacing. Um, I, I, just to respond to one point in Abby's question, I, th I, I think one thing you were asking, Abby, was, was um, do we have a strategy for engaging more with different parts of the sector who might actually be supportive of what we're doing? And, and uh, the answer is yes, although it needs to be perhaps more fully developed. And, and we very often, when we issue press releases, we ask for a quote, for example, from the NCBO, um, the Institute of Fundraising is always very willing to provide a supportive quote for us. We'd be very happy to take supportive quotes from the mid-size group. Uh, but um, I, I, I think it's extremely valuable as we move forward now in the way that Michael described, if we can get uh, the different parts of the sector that have been extremely collaborative with us to actually publicly support what we're doing. Any, any more questions, uh, Abby? No, that's uh, everything. Usually, it's usually three. You usually get three questions. I've never had a case where we only had two questions. Which is great. Question. I think the great news is that as a regulator, you're now a year old. Do you feel you have all the elements in place to now do some of the look forward? So this starts to move as a regulator almost onto an ASA style footing where, yes, there's some tough stories and some tough adjudications, but actually there's some adjudications that might actually fall on the side of the charity as well. And just to add a little bit more balance, assuming the facts as such are there, going forward? Well, one hopes that, one hopes that the new regime, uh, the new regulatory regime, as between the Charity Commission, as between the ICO and, uh, and ourselves, um, will create a sea change. Unfortunately, um, when nobody misbehaves, it's not exactly good news, is it? You know, um, uh, and it is the bad news always that will attract the media attention. 
uh, but we will do everything we can to, to move into a more positive phase if it's justified by the response of, of the different parts of this that we become redundant, that, you know, the work's finished and there are no more complaints. Um, that, that is a measure of success. Uh, we shall see how that goes, but I, I do agree with you, you know, the more positive messages we can get out there, uh, the better it will be. Paul Bentley from the Daily Mail. Um, a simple one, who are the, which are the charities, that have not the major charities that haven't paid the levy? Uh, we have yet to take a decision as a board as to whether we will name and shame. I know uh, what Stuart said, that's the first time I've heard him say that. Um, but we will, we will take our time uh, and, and give everybody an opportunity finally to come on board before we decide whether we feel we should do that. Now, you will see a list of those that have paid, and no doubt, no doubt with some forensic, you can make some guesses as to who isn't on the list. Uh, but you would then have to refer to the Charity Commission submissions about how much they spend each year on fundraising, and I have to tell you those figures are not very accurate, as right. we found out in our dealings with the charity. There have been a lot of disputes about, yeah, we know we told the Charity Commission we spend 120000 but actually we only spent eighty. Well, then why did you? And then we get the blame for getting the numbers wrong. But, uh, uh, you know, all in good time. This might be for Jenny, just to follow up. Uh, just to clarify it, with the um, FPS, if a charity isn't paying the levy, will they show up if people search for them and try to yes. stop communication yes. from them? Yes. They still work? Yes, absolutely. So are there any the No, it's any registered charity. Yeah. So it's any, any registered yeah. charity. No exclusions. Okay, well, thank you all. Oh, the, 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 yes. um, what are your expected running costs for the FPS? Well, the first thing to say is that we, when we did our budget, uh, we included a figure uh, for the FBS before we, it had gone out to tender or anything, and we we are I don't think we are absolutely delighted that the, that the figure has come in well below what we anticipated it was going to cost. So I don't think I think it's probably commercially sensitive. I would guess. And uh, do we disclose it? Yeah. We do. Oh, okay. It's not that commercially sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Not, not any longer. Um, I think um, what we what we said from memory, and my colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong, was the roughly speaking the setup costs for the FPS are two hundred and fifty thousand, and the annual running costs are four hundred and fifty thousand. But that is a forecast, and it obviously depends on usage of the service, and not least the extent to which, we're, we're, as, as Jenny said, we will drive people as far as possible to using the online system. Uh, if there is a large take up of the telephone system. Uh, that that will cost more than if there isn't. So I, I think 450k a year is probably um, a, a a large figure, and it may not it may not be that much. But we are we are delighted that what our estimates were at the beginning for what the, what the FPS was going to cost, uh, we've come in well so materially below what we first anticipated yes. in our in our draft budget a year ago. Absolutely. So and, and, and that draft budget was based on the predictions by the FPS working group, very early uh, forecasts of what it might cost. Thank you. Well, I'll leave you now to go and follow the test match at Laws. Uh, and it, it remains for me to thank you, thank you all for your, for your contributions and for attending. And once again, my thanks to my board, many of whom are here, and, and also uh, to the team, uh, and also to Stuart for giving up time to come today. Thank you all very much indeed.